Bow. I'm the program director at Cancer Support Community South Bay, where we offer free psychosocial support groups, as well as educational workshops and healthy lifestyle and mind body classes, among other things. Um, today, though, I am representing the South Bay Survivorship Consortium. And this is a collaboration of healthcare providers and not for profit community based organizations who work together to provide quality education for cancer survivors. Um, like all of our other programs, we're recording this program today and it'll be available on the Torrance Memorial website, which we'll put into the chat box uh, probably in about a week. Uh, today's program focuses on our skin. Okay, my sincerest apologies for that interruption. Um, as I was saying, today's workshop focuses on, on our skin, and we're going to be learning important information on skin cancer prevention and early detection, as well as managing skin care issues during and after cancer treatment. So first, some Zoom etiquette. All of your microphones need to be muted. They're actually muted for you. And then if you have any questions during the presentation, we ask you to please use the chat box and type your questions in there. And at the end of the presentation, we'll go through those and have the doctor answer those. The other thing is that instead of a sign-in sheet, we're using the participant list that you see on the screen. So if your login name is something creative or a nickname or a phone number, we ask you to please let Miriam know. Or if you know how to rename it on the screen, please change that to your first and last name so we can identify you for attendance. The other thing is that instead of a paper evaluation, at the end of the program today, we are going to be using a pop-up type of evaluation. So you'll see right now we're going to launch a, um, a sample poll that we ask you to all answer the question. It says, my favorite way to catch the sun's rays is, so if you could all just choose one of them, gardening, going to the beach, taking a walk. Okay, it looks like we have a fair amount of the responses. If you want to go ahead and share the results, we'll be able to see what is the favorite way to catch the sun's rays. You should be able to see it now. Oh, great. 60% said taking a walk. And that's followed by going to the beach and tied with gardening at 20%. So that's just a fun little survey, but it's an example of how we're going to do the evaluation at the end of the program. And this is really important to us because it helps us for the future in terms of what types of workshops to present down the road. Uh, let's see. So our next program is scheduled for August 22nd. It's going to be on nutrition and looking at inflammation, gut health, and cancer. Our speaker will be Marissa Mindler, -Earp, and she's a clinical dietitian from Torrance Memorial. And then the final program of 2023 is going to be in November, and that's going to feature Susan Starr, who's one of the nurse practitioners at Cancer Care. She'll be addressing late and long-term effects of cancer treatment. So look for that down the road as well. Um, and so tonight, we are pleased to have Dr. Consuelo Veronica David. She is a board-certified dermatologist. She graduated from the University of Maryland Medical School and completed her dermatology training at Harbor UCLA. She loves all aspects of dermatology and places special importance on counseling patients on how to manage their skin conditions. She's been practicing in Torrance since 2016 and loves serving the South Bay community. So please help me welcome Dr. David. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and just let me know if everything looks okay. Yes, it all looks good. Perfect. Thanks so much. Um, 
So yes, th thanks so much, everybody. Um, I'm Consuelo Veronica David. I've I've been so fortunate to practice locally here in the South Bay community for several years now, um, and I also um, did my training locally at, at Harbor UCLA. So I've really grown to love this community. I'm I'm originally from the East Coast, and um, I feel very very lucky to be here. Um, so as as you know, the title of this. Um, this presentation is what cancer survivors need to know skin health and skin cancer prevention and what you'll find is um a lot a lot of what you need to know as a cancer survivor is applies generally to um to what what most would you know the most most precautions that um that anyone would need to know and um to prevent skin cancer and to to identify it as well let me go ahead and go through so the skin is the largest organ of the body, and um, it's with us, you know, our, our entire life from from childhood and through all um, the fun times we have during the summer, as as well as during our later years. And I think one of the great things now is that um, we've all become very aware of the effects of the sun, um, both the short and the long term effects. And so it's changed our our mindset about how to protect our skin. Um, what is skin cancer? So skin cancer is a malignant condition that begins when cells on the body, on, on, the, on the skin or the outer surface of the body, begin to change in an abnormal way. And there are two very broad types of skin cancers. There is melanoma, which is the most aggressive and unpredictable form of skin cancer, and non-melanoma skin cancers. Non-melanoma skin cancers tend to be more common with prolonged sun exposure, and it's when the top layer of skin um, changes over time. Melanoma is the type of skin cancer that develops from the same type of cells that moles, so spots that we normally think of as brown and uniform, um, develop from. And melanoma can be can develop either from UV exposure or long-term UV exposure. Um, and there are some patients who unfortunately also have a genetic predisposition for developing melanomas. So about one in five Americans will be diagnosed with skin cancer in their lifetime. So it's pretty prevalent. Um, it's one of the most common types of cancer that's diagnosed annually. And fortunately am among the most common types um, basal cell is the most common, and I'll, I'll show you a couple examples of that. And the good news with that is that while it is um, can grow and we like to treat it, it's not necessarily super aggressive. Um, and because it's the most common, you know, being the most common type of, of cancer that's diagnosed, um, the, the overall incidence can um, outnumber the, the combined incidence of breast, lung, colon, and prostate cancer. Melanoma itself, which is that skin cancer that comes from cells that make pigment, accounts for a small percentage of the cases, so about 3% of the cases, but it is the type of skin cancer that accounts for the greatest proportion of actual deaths that develop from skin cancer. What are the causes of skin cancer? So there is a, a small role in, there is a role in, of genetics to a certain extent. Um, but the most obvious one that we also are aware of and that we at least can have some level of control over in our lifestyle is exposure to UV radiation. And up to 90% of the non-melanoma skin cancers are caused by prolonged sun exposure over the course of someone's lifetime. So um, what I tell a lot of my patients is that you know, you may, if, if they have been using sunscreen and wearing hats and long sleeves for regularly for the past five years, but they find that they're starting to develop some skin cancers now, it may not necessarily be, be due to the behaviors that they um, are, um, that they are practicing in the moment, but it might have been from cumulative sun exposure in their past, in the past. Um, another type of known trigger for skin cancer is tanning. And fortunately, um, that is no longer a super popular practice. So how does the sun affect your skin? Um, there are two main types of ways. So one is aging, and that's ultimately through the UVA rays. 
And the second is through brightening of the skin, and that's usually through the rays that are categorized as UVB or in the UVB spectrum. Um, and there are two types of skin damage that occur from radiation. So one is carcinogenesis, which is the actual mutation of the cells, which eventually turn into a, a type of a skin cancer or, um, or sun damage um, to the skin. And that's due to the anti-inflammatory effects of UV light. So we actually take it, so the UV light exposure to the UV light will suppress the immune system in the skin slightly. And, and sometimes in dermatology, we actually take advantage of this property in a very controlled way. Um, but long-term exposure can allow mutations to develop and skin cancers to proliferate in certain parts of the skin. And the second, second type of sun damage is um, through photoaging. And that's because the, um, due to the pro-inflammatory effects that the sun can have on the skin as well. And the photoaging part is mostly presents as um, wrinkles and redness and um, changes in the skin that, that have to do with, with um, what we most associate with, with youthful looking skin. So here on the left is an example of the carcinogenic um, outcomes of skin cancers. And we'll see a couple other photos later on, but red spots all throughout this individual's face, some with what we describe as crust or scaling. And um, this example over here um, on the right is an example of the photoaging properties of, of the sun. So heavy, um, deeper wrinkles in this individual. And this photo is a very classic image that was, I believe it was from the New England Journal of Medicine that demonstrates the photo aging properties of the sun. Um, this individual was a truck driver. So as you can imagine, um, the left side of the skin was exposed to the sun more chronically than the right side. And you can see very, a very clear distinction between the skin quality on the left side of this individual's face compared to the right side. So who's at risk for skin cancer? So um, patients of all ethnicities and skin colors can be, are, are at risk for skin cancer depending on their level of um, sun exposure and, and for some their genetics. So. Um, a person who has a parent or a sibling who's diagnosed with melanoma has a 50% greater chance of developing melanoma than those who have no family members. So we'll see a lot of patients with skin, um, first skin checks um, who have a family history of melanoma. Patients who have fair skin, light eyes, and light hair don't have as much pigment in their skin and therefore don't have as much built-in photoprotection, and they're at a higher risk of developing skin cancers. And while skin cancer develops less frequently in African-American, Black American populations, Latinx and Asian populations, um, it can still develop. And sometimes, um, um, and, and potentially it, the rates might be a little bit lower than what we recognize due to lower detection rates. But I have had patients within these ethnic backgrounds who have, um, who have had skin cancer and been diagnosed with skin cancer. As it relates to you as cancer survivors, there are a couple of specific um, exposures or potentially um, parts of your history that might put you at, at risk for skin cancer. Um, if at any point in time during your treatment or as a part of the nature of um, the cancer that you experienced, um, there was um, a time of immunosuppression that can increase someone's risk of cancer. Um, some cancer patients go through radiation treatment in order to treat their specific condition. And that radiation treatment um, in and of itself, while it is overall beneficial, um, can expose, um, can, can change some aspects of the skin in that area and put that specific area, and that specific area of skin that was exposed to the radiation can have slightly higher risks of developing skin cancer as well. And for some patients, there is a genetic component. So um, while there aren't a lot of skin cancers, for example, such as um, 
colon cancer that has a direct correlation to a specific type of skin cancer. We do know that there are some mutations in individuals who've had pancreatic cancer, for example, um, and that mutation also puts them and potentially family members at a higher risk of developing melanoma at some point during their lifetime. So as part of this, I just wanted to introduce you to the main types of skin cancers and, and how to detect them, what they look like in case you or, or a loved one might, um, might notice something. So the most common types of skin cancers are one, basal cell carcinoma, two, squamous cell carcinoma, and three, melanoma, which um, as I've mentioned is the most serious and um, the most unpredictable of the three. So basal cell carcinoma is the most common form of skin cancer. And what I often tell patients is that um, if you're going to have a form of skin cancer, this is probably the one to have if you're gonna have one at all because it is slow growing and it's very easily treatable. There's a low risk of metastasizing to other parts of the body. What does basal cell carcinoma look like? It has several different types of appearances. Um, one type of appearance is this pink spot that has a pearly border, just like these, or a pink nodule that is, is growing and looks kind of smooth and translucent. Um, the presentation of a basal cell might be a spot that just doesn't stop bleeding or is ulcerated. There are some subtypes of basal cell that look like scars and some subtypes of basal cell that look like little reddish patches. The second type of skin cancer is squamous cell carcinoma. So squamous cell carcinoma is the second most common type of skin cancer. Um, like basal cell, it is a often looks like a pinkish spot that um, in its own way looks a little bit different, can be a little bit crested, oh, sorry, um, can sometimes be crested or bleeding um, or more, we use the term keratotic, so sometimes a little bit more scaling and heaping on top. Um, it affects about 250,000-ish people per year. And um, while it compared to basal cell carcinoma has a lower rate of metastasis, I mean, sorry, um, has a low rate, sorry, while in general it has a low rate of metastasis, meaning that if it's diagnosed in, in the majority of cases, um, a simple procedure will take care of it. Um, anywhere from two, there, the rate of metastasis is higher than basal cell with about two to 10% um, spreading to, to other areas of the body. So if you, what, how do you know, um, what does a, what does a squamous cell look like? Um, look like, look for growths that are, that can be domed, have a scaly top, and a good um, rule of thumb is any spot that is bleeding or just doesn't seem to heal. And that same rule of thumb goes for basal cell as well. And here are a couple other examples of those. Oftentimes patients who've had a lot of sun exposure will have spots called actinic keratoses. These are not necessarily skin cancers, um, but we do sometimes refer to them as pre-skin cancers. Um, and on the spectrum of sun damage before having a skin cancer, it shows that an individual has had more sun damage than not. Um, the, the statistic is about one in a hundred may eventually progress into a squamous cell carcinoma, which is that second type of skin cancer that I mentioned. So here in the US, we often will treat them. And there are a couple of ways to treat them. One is with a cold spray called liquid nitrogen. Um, sometimes we'll use a cream to treat the area for a couple of weeks. And sometimes we'll use a form of light called blue light to treat the area and kind of cleaning up in the area, if someone has a lot of these on their face can reduce their overall risk of, of skin cancer. So what do these actinic keratoses look like, these, these pre-cancers? They are often little red bumps that sometimes you can feel more than you can see. So if you feel your skin and, and maybe it looks 
you know, unchanged in the mirror, but it feels a little bit sandpapery like, or there's a spot that your finger just keeps finding. And despite how much you scratch it, it just keeps growing back. Um, and that's in a sun exposed area, like your face, the tops of your hands, the tops of your ear, then that could potentially be an actinic keratosis. Another type of precancer um, or precancer spots are, are dysplastic nevi. So these are moles that are not quite melanomas, but have um, some changes in, in the cells and are not completely uniform throughout when we look at them under the microscope. And <clears throat> while these moles are not necessarily always cancerous in and of themselves, when a person has a lot of these moles that are somewhat irregular, it means that it usually means that they have a slightly higher risk of also developing a melanoma over their lifetime. So that brings us to the third type of skin cancer, which is melanoma. And this is um, the one that is the most dangerous and um, the one that the dermatol that always worries dermatologists um, as it is the, the deadliest form of skin cancer, the most unpredictable. So even the smallest ones can sometimes be more severe than they appear to the naked eye. Um, and melanoma is the type of skin cancer that forms from irregularities in the same types of cells that, um, that moles develop from. So it's the most common form of cancer in younger patients, um, in the, usually in the first quarter of their life. Um, and it, as you can see here, it's, it develops from pigmented lesions. So who, who develops melanoma? Who is at risk for melanoma? Um, and individuals who are at risk for melanoma include, as I mentioned before, people who have a family history of melanoma. If a, a father or a sibling has had melanoma, um, that puts someone at higher risk of melanoma. Um, individuals who are, have fairer or lighter skin are at higher risk of melanoma. Um, and there's also some data to show that individuals who've had many sunburns in their youth, so even if you weren't out in the sun all the time, and didn't have prolonged daily exposure, but you had many, several severe sunburns are at higher risk of melanoma overall. Um, and as I mentioned before, there are some patients, not all, but some patients who have um, a specific type of mutation that is associated with pancreatic cancer that may also be at higher risk for melanoma as well. How, what does melanoma look like? What are some of the warning signs? So. One of the um, most common ways to remember, or the easiest ways to remember what to look for melanoma are the A, B, C, D, E's, the melanoma. And we'll go through those. So the A stands for asymmetry. When one part of the brown spot doesn't look like the other. So as you can see in this mole right here, it, it's uniform and symmetric throughout, even though it's not pigmented. This mole, is pigmented throughout, but it has a very dark spot here on what's our left when we're looking at the screen and a flatter light area on the right. And even between the top part and the lower part, there are different colors. So it's, it's very asymmetrical. Can't fold it in half and match both sides. Melanomas will often have irregular borders. So as you can see with this mole here, there's a nice round, smooth border. Melanomas don't really follow rules. So this one has some scalloped borders and you can even see here that it follows that asymmetric rule or has asymmetric properties. If you fold this in half, it doesn't match. You see some darker pigmentation up here and some gray pigmentation down here. Color, so this goes back to that property of symmetry. This mole here on the left is uniformly brown all throughout, whereas this mole has multiple colors, a medium brown, a dark brown, a reddish brown, some lighter spotted browns here on the side. Some melanomas might even have red or blue in them depending on, on the type of pigment that's there. Um, five, sorry about this, right here in the middle. Um, 
the D is for a diameter. So A, B, C, D, D is for a diameter. Um, mel now this isn't a hard and fast rule. There are some very tiny melanomas and often that are spotted by the patients themselves, but um, melanomas, you know, they, they change and they progress quickly. And so um, one of the D in this case stands for a diameter or width greater than six millimeters. And E, which is, it relates to that, what I'd mentioned about some melanomas actually being small is evolving, but really what the property is, is that it's something that's changing. So, you know, there are, there are all these properties and you can remember them, or um, what I also tell a lot of my patients who just kind of want the quick summary is, if you see something that's new, different than any other moles on your body, that's changing, that seems to be bleeding, then come in and have a dermatologist check it out, um, at least for peace of mind to make sure, you know, because sometimes it might be perfectly fine. And other times you might have identified or that individual might have identified something that was more serious. A lot of the patients that come in will say my partner, my daughter, my sister, my friend, notice the spot on my back or notice the spot on my scalp. Um, and that's what brought me in here. You know, there are areas of our body that we just don't really know, know that well because we can't see them. Our hair, our scalp, the backs, you know, our, our individual backs, the backs of our legs. Um, and so, you know, I find that family members and friends play a big role in, um, in my patient's skin health. Um, so, you know, while you don't necessarily have to be doing full body skin checks on your friends and family members, know that if you happen to see something that looks unusual, I think it's always worthwhile to bring it up um, because at best someone comes in and it learns that that spot that looked might have looked funny and might have looked a little different from the rest is perfectly fine and they can be put at ease and um, and in the worst case scenarios which isn't that they're always the worst case scenario um you know you might have identified something that that person needs to have treated and then they can get treatment and um, have it out pretty quickly and the good news is for most skin cancers the treatments um for the majority of skin cancers are, are pretty straightforward um, so we do, you know, um, the AD does encourage patients to do self-skin checks um, just to get a sense of what's on their body um, and to be able to monitor for anything that's new or changing. Um, and you can use that using a mirror at, for the areas that are harder to look at directly, um, a mirror for the front um, to reflect, to use as a reflection, a mirror to, you know, reflect using the back um, behind your head to help see the scalp or behind your ears as well as for your back. Um, what are the most common, if you can't do a full body check, what are the most common areas to look for, to look at if um, you're checking to see if there's a chance that there might be something that you need to have evaluated? Um, those, as you can imagine, are the areas that are most exposed to the sun. Um, or, you know, if as a cancer survivor, you had um, radiation as part of your treatment, um, then the area that was exposed to radiation. Um, as squamous cell carcinomas and, and AK, that kind of keratosis often appear in these areas that were exposed to the sun. So that includes the scalp, either a bald scalp or the part of a scalp. I was just talking to someone today about how people rarely change their part over the course of their lifetime. So there are some people who will notice that just in that line that's been there for their entire life, it feels a little bit more scaly, a little bit more rough than the other areas of their scalp. Um, the face, of course, the ears, an often forgotten area of the ears is the, is the top of the ears. And, you know, here in the South Bay, we have a lot of cyclists, um, a lot of sun exposure in general, just because of the wonderful place that we live in. Um, but, um, you know, the tops of the ears are often forgotten when we put sunscreen on our face and on our neck, um, as well as behind the ears as well. Um, the lips um, are not an intuitive place to put sunscreen as well. So um, skin cancer can occur in that area. 
as well as the back of the hands and the shoulders and the neck. So how do we, if you've had sun exposure or you know that you're at risk, how do you prevent skin cancer? And I think a lot of this information, um, most patients already know to some extent, um, but it's always good to reiterate. So <clears throat> the first thing is it's sunscreen. We recommend, the FDA actually approve, um, recommends an F a SPF of 15 and above, but the AAD, the American Academy of Dermatology, Dermatology recommends um, 30 and above. You wanna look for broad spectrum sunscreens and sunscreens that are water resistant. Um, and also just know that there are no waterproof sunscreens. Um, when we're looking at this term broad spectrum, what does that mean? Um, it means that it protects you from both UV, um, UV light or UV rays that are in the UVA spectrum and in the UVB spectrum. So the UVA rays that, both, that cause both burning and that also cause um, carcinogenesis and, and photo aging in the skin. Um, it used to be, and why, why this is um, relevant is it used to be that some sunscreens only had protection for against UVB rays but left people exposed still to the UVA rays. Um, so this is an example. So sunscreens were not originally prevent, um, developed to prevent skin cancer. They were originally developed to prevent burns so that you could stay out longer in the sun. And, and burns are generally caused by UVB. Um, and previously when, when items were listed as having an SPF, it actually only meant that they had UVB coverage. So when you're looking at the label, and I'll have a couple of examples, you really want to see very clearly that it says it has broad spectrum coverage, not just SPF. Um, and this just kind of speaks to the fact that before um, UVA was not necessarily thought of as a component to protect your skin from when, when making um, sunscreen. And so it meant people could stay out in the sun more because they were not getting sunburned, but um, UVA in and of itself also pl plays a large role in the development of skin cancers and photo, photo aging. So they weren't necessarily protected from that. Um, and these are just examples of those processes again. So carcinogenesis after a long time and then fo photo aging after prolonged sun exposure. So um, how do you apply sunscreen? So it's always a good thing to make sunscreen um, a regular habit and part of your day. Um, so one of the first things that I do in the morning after, you know, along with brushing my teeth and washing my face is I, um, I put on my sunscreen. And uh, my friends make fun of me because I never leave the house without sunscreen. I even put on sunscreen before walking outside to take out the trash or I'll, I'll throw my hat on as well. Um, oftentimes people... Um, don't put on as much sunscreen as they need. Um, for your entire body, it actually takes about two tablespoons or at least your face, arms, legs of, of sunscreen to really make sure you have a good protective coating. And um, you wanna make sure to apply it um, every two hours or and especially after swimming or exercising, um, moving your body heavily. Um, and in addition to looking at the label for an SPF of 30 or more, that's broad spectrum, you also want to look for um, UV blocking ingredients like zinc and titanium oxide. Some of the chemical sunscreens that do this are avobenzone and oxybenzone. Um, so just to summarize again, you want to look for broad spectrum sunscreens because these cover both UVA and UVB. So they protect you from burns and from the damaging effects of the sun, such as um, skin cancer and um, photo aging. Um, in general, we recommend, the AD recommends looking for an SPF 30 or greater, not necessarily 15. Um, having said that, a higher SPF rating doesn't necessarily mean better. Higher SPFs are usually only very mildly or minimally in, um, better at um, providing coverage to the skin than the lower SPF. So I usually tell my patients to um, look for anything between SPF 30 to 50 
And what, um, one of the FDA proposed recommendations coming up is actually to limit the sunscreen um, maximum SPF to, to 60 plus as the rating. So that has been proposed. It's not in full effect yet, but it, it, is, it is one of the proposals. Um, you want to look for sunscreens that are water resistant. Um, just know that nothing is waterproof. Um, I believe that sunscreens are uh, at this time are, are no longer actually allowed to market themselves as being waterproof. Um, try to apply sunscreen to your skin about 15 minutes before you leave the house or before doing activities. And don't forget to use sunscreens that have S um, lip balms or lipsticks that have SPF in them to protect the lips as well because into people can get skin cancer there and to reapply, um, especially when you're being active or when you're outside for a long time. Um, so these are just a couple examples of labels. So this one is broad spectrum at SPF 15. So um, it has a broad spectrum part. And this one just says SPF 30. So it's the minimum, sun has the minimum level of sun protection factor, but isn't necessarily broad spectrum. This one is broad spectrum, but the sun protection factor is, is too low. So I, I would not purchase any of these at, at the drugstore. Other really important ways of protecting our skin from the sun and really valuable ways without applying sunscreen are, are using physical blockers. So clothing. Um, <clears throat> one of the nice things you know about this area too is that it's um even though there's a lot of sun and the climate is great, it's also it also can be pretty cool at times. So you can enjoy, you know, the benefits of the sun, but also still protect your skin by wearing long sleeve clothes. Um, the thicker the fabric, the more protected the skin is. The thinner the fabric, the more the UV rays can come through. Um, and that's why there are some great, you know, clothing articles and products out there that still allow for breathability, but have tight weaves that can protect your skin from the sun. Um, hats are always a great idea, not just baseball caps because they still expose the ears, the sides of the face and neck, but, but wide brimmed hats, um, usually at least two and a half to three inches at a minimum. Um, and that's really protective and it's a nice um, staple to have in your car or when you're going to go out for a walk, as well as um, UV blocking glasses or when you're gardening. Um, some clothing also have um, sun protecting tractor ingredients um, embedded in them, in addition to just being protective in and of themselves due to their thickness. Um, and um, many of you might have children or grandchildren. Um, children are at higher risk of not necessarily skin cancer directly, but sun damage to their skin, especially at their young age, because their skin isn't fully developed. However, at the same time, we usually recommend um, avoiding application of sunscreen until after six months. So for young children, it's really best to keep them in the shade, have them wear hats, um, and so, you know, to try to still enjoy, again, all the lifestyle and, and the great things that the South Bay has to offer, but, but covered and protected. Um, and a couple of, um, a couple of um, controversies. So um, there is one controversy that claims that sunscreen can cause vitamin deficiency. Um, and there are studies um, because it's, you know, preventing the skin from the sun from hitting the skin. Um, and there are studies that show that um, uh, regular use of sunscreen doesn't necessarily um, affect um, um, vitamin D levels. Um, and that the benefits of protecting your skin from the sun out outweigh the risk of vitamin D deficiency, especially because we have some great supplements that are out on the market. Um, another, another controversy is that oxybenzone, which is a, um, a chemical-based sunscreen that reflects the UV rays off the skin, is a synthetic estrogen and can interfere with hormone levels. Um, and um, for this particular controversy, you know, these, these elevated hormone levels um, and elevated levels of estrogen were, were found in, um, in a study with mice. And these mice were exposed to extremely high levels of oxybenzone, um, far different from the levels of oxybenzone that we are exposed to in, in topical sunscreens. Um, 
And while oxybenzone actually is absorbed into the body, it doesn't necessarily accumulate and it's not necessarily stored in our body. Um, and then, you know, fortunately, I won't speak much of this because people don't tan that much before, but it was, a it was, um, you know, it was popular in the past and, and um, um, does put people at higher risk of, of developing skin cancer now, even if they don't tan um, any longer. Um, and, and the good news is tanning beds have been banned, um, at least for younger individuals in many states. Um, in addition to sunscreen and clothes, there are just some lifestyle things that um, people can implement. Um, so seeking shade, not, not going out and being out in the sun during the peak times of, of, um, of sun, which is between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. So some patients who are at higher risk will go out for their walks, go surfing, do all their outdoor activities before way, up, um, way in the morning and then or later at night. Um, as I mentioned, nice, apply a nice healthy layer of sunscreen. Um, the SPF 30 broad spectrum that I mentioned, um, covering up and then um, doing a self skin exam, understanding which moles, which spots have been present on your body for a while so that you can also identify which ones might be new and which ones um, might be changing. Um, and as I mentioned, fortunately, compared to some other types of cancers, um, skin cancers for the most part, are pretty straightforward to treat. Um, they can be treated surgically, whether it's with, through an outpatient surgery where we cut around the area and, and throw a couple stitches in um, on the face. Sometimes there's a more complex surgery that's required called Mohs surgery, but it's still outpatient, doesn't require um, general anesthesia to complete. Um, some melanomas, depending on how deep they are, can be treated with surgical excision. Other melanomas, if they're deeper, might require um, coordination with, um, with a surgical oncologist, a medical oncologist, sometimes radiation oncologist, depending on, on how advanced it is. Um, and there are also many skin cancers, depending on the subtype, that now we feel pretty comfortable treating with certain creams. Um, and again, it's, it's dependent on the specific type of, of cancer. Um, and then finally, I know, I know we're on time, but in addition to just um, broadly, you know, going over skin cancer is what to look for um, in terms of you as cancer survivors. Um, many patients um, who are undergoing various cancer treatments might experience dryness, really severe dryness, cracking in their skin. Um, and so moisturizing is, is a really important um, aspect of just staying comfortable, not itching, not developing a rash. Um, in terms of moisturizers, thick emollients like um, Aquaphor, Vaniply, which is um, uh, another petroleum-based ointment or CeraVe, are really nice and they don't usually sting if you have open wounds. Um, some patients will have cuts and fissures on their skin. Um, so you can use a lot of Aquaphor there, although it requires lots of regular frequent application that can be helpful too. Um, some patients with really deep fissures will recommend actually putting a little bit of super glue right in the fissure, which acts like a long-term bandage. Um, and that can be helpful so that when you're using your hands, um, it doesn't snag on things as much. If you're cutting a lemon, it doesn't sting. Um, some patients who are undergoing treatment might develop a rash during their treatment. And so, you know, talking to your doctor or sometimes to a dermatologist, we can provide, um, prescribe medications to help calm down that rash to make them, to make you um, or make a person more comfortable. Um, and then some patients um, might have already experienced this, but can can experience a rash in an area where they had radiation, um, mostly from that exposure. And then there are a couple of ways to to mitigate the symptoms of that. So that wraps up my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions, and I, I really appreciate your time and attention. Thank you so much. That was so educational. And um, I really appreciate seeing the different pictures of everything as well. 
Um, I do have some questions that came through. So the first one is asking for patients who are being immunosuppressed, are they more susceptible to sun sensitivity? Yes, yes. I um, Well, I should say sun sensitivity in the form of sensitivity to radiation, maybe not always as much um, physically experiencing a sunburn, but for example, a patient who has a, a darker skin type, um, like an Asian patient who is either actively immunosuppressed for their cancer treatment or is immunosuppressed because of the type of cancer they have, is more likely to um, experience the, the carcinogenic, um, is at higher risk of experiencing the carcinogenic changes to their skin from exposure to the sun. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, next question is asking, does it matter if it is sunscreen that is sheer or ultra sheer or regular? Right. Um, the short answer is, is not really. Um, as long as it's, you know, gen general rule of thumb, SPF 30 is indicated to be broad spectrum and you're putting enough on your face then and and reapplying when necessary um then either of those are fine i know um neutrogena uses those terms and it's really because the um some sunscreens are so white they're really not also cosmetically acceptable so they had to put in greens and then to make them more cosmetically acceptable but it's really important just to put a thick enough amount on like it might even involve putting some on applying it letting it dry and then putting another layer on after is just to make sure you have enough on. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, this question is asking, how much spray sunscreen do you need? Oh, that's a good question. You know, um, people have different um, recommendations regarding spray. I, one of my colleagues really loves spray sunscreen. He actually always recommends, there's a Trader Joe's zinc spray sunscreen that he uses and loves. Um, <clears throat> I don't like it as much because I think it's easy to miss areas to think that you're spraying and then it's a windy day and then the sun, you know, the sunscreen gets blown down down the street. So I think it's easy to miss areas, but if you're, you know, inside and you're able to see that you're able to get a healthy amount on you and often with spray sunscreens, you can see a little bit of a sheer, um, like a sheer layer, then I think that's, that that's sufficient. Um, but it is harder to quantify it because you can't use that tablespoon quantity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, this person's asking, can a mole you've had for a long time, like since childhood, become cancerous? Um, the short answer is yes, but a lot of times um, they're they're usually benign and unchanged. One of the things that can be confusing too for patients is um, some moles that are brown over time, um, just as part of their natural, we call it like their natural history, will lose their pigment and change from being dark brown. So you might've had a, a dark brown mole on your cheek that eventually became flesh colored and, and lost its pigment over time. And that's, that's normal. Um, what's not normal is when a mole that was flat and uniform starts growing, having those irregular borders and those different colors. So um, again, it's not oftentimes moles that have been there forever are usually unchanged and are safe, but if you start to see a change, then have it checked out. Okay, excellent. Um, what creams are good for radiation burn? Usually petroleum jellies like, um, um, or ointments, aquaphor, um, Vanna cream, the brand Vanna cream is a really nice brand for ultra sensitive skin because it's it's absent of a lot of products. So they have an ointment version there. Um, <clears throat> and then sometimes we'll prescribe topical steroids to help calm down all that inflammation that develops after a radiation dermatitis. Okay. Um, another question here is, is photo aging cancer? Photo aging is not cancer. It's more, it's more cosmetic. Okay. And then this person's asking, 
Would you recommend a skin check for anyone that has had radiation? Also, have you heard of any cases of skin issues that develop down the road from a patient who's had radiation? Yeah, um, I don't think there are any broad, I think it wouldn't hurt if someone has the time and, and the ability to do so, even if, if it's just once. Um, there aren't necessarily formal recommendations by the American Academy of Dermatology, for example, that say anyone who's had radiation should go have a skin check. But I think that someone who has had radiation in the area and who, who's also had um, a lot of sun exposure throughout their lifetime um, would, would probably benefit from, from a quick check, um, especially if they see some changes in the area that look different. You know, if it's just red, then, then maybe not as urgent. Okay, thank you. This next question is one I was wondering about as well, but someone posted, should sunscreen go under makeup or over, under moisturizer or over? Oh, that's a really good question. Okay, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So for makeup, I usually advise people to put it under their makeup. And um, the nice thing too is many foundation, if you're going to put a layer of foundation or anything, that, that adds another layer on top. As for a moisturizer, um, so some sunscreen, some moisturizers have sunscreen built in. I usually put the moisturizer on first and then the sunscreen and then the makeup. Okay, good to know. Uh, this person's asking, why does skin feel so dry after chemo and cancer treatments? What uh, do you recommend for good skin care during cancer treatments? Um, I think, you know, so one, it depends on the treatment. So for example, there are um, <clears throat> specific medications like the EGFR inhibitors, um, like erlotinib, tigriso, which is the brand name. I think it's uh, osmertinib, which um, affect the keratinocytes directly. And so by, by changing those, inhibiting those, that can make the skin really dry. Um, universally for some chemotherapies too, just by, by halting some of the, you know, the regeneration of the cells, it can make the skin dry as well in that way. Um, I think, you know, some people, uh, petroleum, like thicker ointments, like Aquaphor, CeraVe ointment has one, which I've mentioned, um, and Vaniply. I know I've mentioned these before. They're, they're really good, but they also, and, and really moisturizing, but they also feel kind of greasy. Some people just don't love the greasy feel of that, or don't love it on their hands. Cause then you start writing something or typing and it gets all over your stuff. Um, so, um, there are nice thick creams that strike a healthy balance. So CeraVe has a really nice thick cream that, that I recommend a lot. Um, Eucerin also has a shea butter based cream that that's nice. And, and Vanna cream also has a nice cream um, so that that can be helpful with the dryness. Okay, good. Those are good suggestions. Um, we have somebody who's asking about, um, they were diagnosed with four squamish cell cancers to what were on the face and they were surprised when their dermatologist said that Mohs surgery was not necessary due to margins and had just burned them off. And they have a follow-up, but they thought that Mohs um, was the one way to definitely ensure that all the cancer has been removed. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that? Mm. I guess it would, I think it depends on the specific situation um, and the specific diagnosis. So, so it's hard to say. Um, but there are, you know, there are, I'll, I'll give an example of not, not necessarily like the margins example in this case, but um, some patients who have shallow forms of, of squamous cell carcinoma, so squamous cell carcinoma in situ, um, we'll discuss the option of using a cream for that. So can't use that for a deeper squamous cell, but maybe a cream for this. And, you know, we go through all the risk, you know, potential risks of using that, you know, which include irritation, potentially some form of reoccurrence and having to monitor the area because we haven't necessarily confirmed that the whole thing is cut out. 
but um, it's balanced by the benefit of not necessarily having to go through yet another surgery, for some, which is the case for some patients. So most doctors will have their rationale. And I think for that individual person going back and sort of maybe asking one more time or, you know, to, to understand the pros and cons of, of those options, it would be helpful. Thank you. Um, this question's asking, is there a natural oil that is beneficial to apply to our skin? A natural um, oil. <clears throat> Some patients really like coconut oil. Um, I think it's totally safe and, and not harmful. Um, and some people love it and they think it's, it's great and super useful. Um, and then, you know, for those who aren't really getting enough relief after that, I'll, I'll recommend some of the products that you can find at, at drugstores. Okay. And um, do you have a recommendation for a best anti-itch medication for chemo side effects if hydrocortisone is not working? Mm, yeah, I think the simplest thing to do is to ask your doctor for a stronger topical steroid. There are many topical steroids out there. And, and for, I know hydrocortisone or over-the-counter cortisone is great because it's so available and you can just go out and get it, but it's also really mild. Um, so just know that there are options outside of that, albeit they're, they're often prescription. Okay. Um, someone here is asking that they've noticed um, after their breast radiation, some skin tags below their armpit pit have become irritated or sensitive, and they wanted to know if it's okay to ask the dermatologist to remove them, even if they aren't appearing to be cancerous. Mm -hmm. It's it's definitely okay. I will say that um, a lot of times skin tags are not covered by insurance, so there might be an out-of-pocket cost that's associated with that, even if it's not necessarily cancerous. Okay, good to know. Um, do you have time for a couple more questions? Yeah. I have some ones that came to me uh, directly. Um, so uh, does my diet affect my skin and what kind of diet should I eat that I would imagine be good for skin? <laughs> that, that is a really good question. Um, I think the short answer is there aren't really any strong, any, any studies that specifically show a relationship between diet and skin health. Now there are some conditions where we know certain, like, like psoriasis. So not within, not, not what the subject of what we're talking about today, that where certain diets have been shown to have anti-inflammatory properties and then really help that skin condition. Um, but not necessarily as it relates to um, skin cancer. Okay. The, the next question is asking um, if you're using a moisturizer and your skin starts to become red or react, what should someone do? Ah, good question. So stop that moisturizer because maybe there's a product or a preservative there. Um, and then... Um, you know, if all you have access to is an over-the-counter cortisone or hydrocortisone, I think that's fine to apply. Um, but if it's not responding or if it's getting worse, then I, I would see, you know, either your primary care doctor or if you have a dermatologist and can, can get in with one, um, see a dermatologist. Okay. And I'm just going to ask two more because I want to be really respectful of your time and also just remind everybody to please stay on just for a few more minutes to answer that or to fill out that evaluation. Um, but here is this question. It's saying, how can I tell if skincare, a skincare tip is um, legitimate if I see it on social media? So a skincare <laughs> tip or product. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good question. It's hard. It's hard. And it, what's really interesting I find is um, I'll have, I mean, I, you know, social media is great. It's a really great form of educating many people and kind of democratizing that information. At the same time, you're exactly right. It is difficult to tease out um, what information is, is accurate and what might be a little bit misleading or what might be misinformed. You know, someone is sharing it out of the goodness of their heart, but maybe they might be a little bit misinformed. That is really difficult. I think, you know, maybe the simplest way to approach it is, um, information that's coming from 
a, a board certified or, you know, like, like a practitioner is probably going to be more reliable than um, information from someone who's just, who's tried many things, you know, and they, they might be educated in their own way, but I think they're, they're coming, they might be coming to conclusions in, in, from a different perspective, you know. Okay. And then the last question I'll just ask is one here in the chat box that says, doesn't steroids on the skin cause skin thinness? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I like that question a lot because it's um, a lot of patients ask me that. So um, yes, when someone uses a steroid um, every day for a long period of time on either a certain part of the body or the wrong part of the body, it can thin your skin. Um, but overall, I really, I try to, um, um, just educate my patients not to be afraid of steroids because they can be really, really helpful when used within the right parameters. Um, you know, someone can, can, it's a really, really helpful tool. So as long as you know the parameters to use it, when to stop, when to start, then um, they can be used very safely, even really strong steroids on areas of the body that we consider to be very sensitive, we can use when used within certain guardrails. Okay, well, wonderful. We had so many questions tonight. And I think that just speaks to how important and how many different areas of skin protection and hair and cancer um, there are. So thank you, Dr. David, for sharing your, your knowledge. And I'm going to invite everybody at this time to please stay on.